Hey, River Church, it's Tim. I'm here from Ben's Beans. I want to go over the rest of our series. We're moving into Chapter 2 in Philippians. So I'm really excited about this one. I uh, mentioned in the past that this is actually when I took my I took a, a Greek Philippians class where we focused on the Greek translation. When I took this, this was actually the text that I worked out of for my uh, final project. So this is a, a passage I've spent a lot of time in. What I want to dive into is a couple different subsections within this. So the section that I focused on was called the Christ Hymn. This was a worship song that was written way, way back in the first decade of the church about Christ, which was a shift because before Christ was crucified, resurrected, and exalted into heaven, there weren't songs about Jesus. They were just songs about God. You can read the book of Psalms. There's no mention of Christ explicitly. So this is like one of the first songs that were ever written about Jesus. So this was a big deal. Now, Paul includes this in here because it draws a line directly from what he's trying to teach them to what he wants to move on. So for right now, we are focusing on a four-step process to bridge the gap between what was said back then to what God means for us now. The four steps we use is first to understand what the author intended for the original audience. Uh, two, to examine the differences in culture between the present and the biblical audiences. What is the general, the theological principle in this text? And then how should we apply this to our lives? So what we're trying to look at is originally, what did Paul say to the church in Philippi? What was God saying through Paul to the church in Philippi? What was God saying to the capital C church, the big picture church? And then ultimately, what is God saying to you and me? I want to spend time fleshing out steps one and two. If we do a good job understanding what did Paul mean to the church in Philippi, and what, what, what did God mean to the church in Philippi, if we spend a little time on that, then we're going to be able to understand really the rest of it just by following the steps. So the three subsections that I have here are going to be verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, chapter 2, 5, and then chapter 2, 6 to 11. Break these up very specifically. If you remember last week, the discussion was entering into what's called an ethical section. Now, ethics discuss what ought to be, maybe an ideal, maybe something that's not always realized, but that uh, someone as a follower of Christ should certainly strive for. It's what ought to be. So when he opens up in uh, 2, 1 to 4, he, he starts this, it's a little bit tricky to read even in English, but in Greek it's a nightmare. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. What this can be broken down to, to help simplify it a little bit, is these are separate, about four separate if-then statements. So if you have any encouragement in Christ, then make my joy complete and be of one mind. If you have any comfort from love, then you can make my joy complete and be of one mind. So this continues. You can break down these four. It's if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, and any affection or sympathy. Ultimately, these are things that as Christians we get to benefit from. We get to experience what it's like to be in community in a church. Maybe right now, with everything going on with the pandemic, uh, a little less so, but there is still community in Christ, and this is important. So these four are Paul saying, if you enjoy the benefits of being a Christian, everything that Christ has brought you and blessed you with, then let us be of one mind. And then moves on to say, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourself. So that first part, he talks about selfish ambition or conceit. If you remember a couple weeks ago, we had discussed 
when Paul was in chains, that there were some out there that were preaching the gospel, but they were doing so in an attempt to either advance their own standing, to take on Paul's followers. For a number of reasons, they were ambitious and envious. And so we see this flashback. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So what we're having here is the foundation. Last week we talked about, ultimately, what is Paul saying in this entire ethical section about what ought to be. We had talked about how, ultimately, what Paul wants to get across is that the gospel is number one. In Christ, there is no need for any addition or subtraction. Christ is enough. And that in the church, ultimately our goal is to be more like Christ. And that is the power of the gospel. Here's where he goes into a little more detail about what that might mean in the life of the church in Philippi. And so first he talks about don't be ambitious. Don't be self-promoting or build yourself up, but instead look at others and their interests and make them more important than your own. This is outrageous generosity. When's the last time you've looked at someone else and put their needs so far above yours that you actually cared about just their interests, their benefits? You thought so deeply about that. I think husbands and wives, we often experience this. But this wasn't talking about within families. This was talking about within the church, brothers and sisters, people who are beautifully strangers, that were to have this same love for them. Now, here's where it's going to take a shift. Verse 5, we have this bridge passage. It is a little bit tricky. Um, this, whole, this whole section, really, in the Greek, it is a nightmare. It is hard to work with. So in 5, a very literal translation of what it says is it's a uh, parallel statement. So statement 1 and then statement 2 says, Think this in yourselves, which also in Christ Jesus. This is a very literal translation. The reason that this is important, and I'll read it again in a second, is you'll see there's just something missing. And this would be a key verb, something to make the two connect. So again, it's think this in yourselves, which also in Christ. So there's got to be something supplied in order for this to make any sense in English. There's two major directions that they can go. So one of the directions is to see this as a continuation of an ethical text that ultimately Paul is saying this is how it ought to be. So that translation would be, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Uh, one of the issues with this translation is it does lack a little bit of uh, continuation. The parallel messages kind of miss when we move from let this mind be in you, which is present, and that was in Christ Jesus. There doesn't seem to be that, that jump, but there also does seem to be something to this ethical nature about how things ought to be. So then the other side would be, think this way amongst yourselves, which also you think in Christ Jesus. This is messy, and it is wordy, and it's not really pretty. The ESV uses a much more uh, literal translation. It really leans towards that ethical because it's open-ended. You can translate it however you like. It says, have this mind among, you, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So these different translations have a number of issues, but I think ultimately they all communicate the same thing. So this wordy one, it says, think this way among yourselves, which also you think in Christ Jesus. The impact of this one is that it emphasizes a communal aspect that ultimately the way we are among other in the church, so also we must think when we are communing with Christ. The ESV does hit this in-between pretty well, and I don't think there's a perfect English translation. Um, but using the ESV, we end up with a both-and answer, 
that it's both ethical and communal. It talks about how things ought to be and also how things are when we're in community with each other and with Christ. This is hugely significant because of what we're about to move into. So one more time to summarize where we're at so far, because when we jump into the hymn, which is next, when we jump into this hymn, it moves quickly. So we understand that Paul's call to the church in Philippi is that they ought not to be selfish, but instead look at the interests of others. This is because the way that they should be like Christ. So we jump into the hymn, and I want to read this because it is beautiful. So it says, uh, uh, Which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This passage takes two very specific approaches to Christ. In 6 through 8, it highlights Christ's humility. He was absolutely, holistically humble. He was on the throne. And instead of owning his godhood, instead of being the almighty and entitled, he humbled himself. He made himself low to the lowest point possible. A baby. Someone who's helpless. So that he could go on, grow up, become a servant to men, the people whom he loved, the people whose worship he deserved. He made himself humble to and became a servant unto them. Then further, he faced ultimate humiliation by dying a horrific death on the cross and taking on the weight of all the sin of the earth. This is the most dramatic form of humility the world has ever seen. So then it flips, and this is the key, is this transition, this jump. It's sharp. In uh, 9 through 11, it shifts to how he was exalted. And this is important, because right now, Christ is sitting on his throne. And so Paul highlights this, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory God the Father. Here's why we had to spend that time on that bridge section. If we look at an ethical text and then jump into this, the message wrongly becomes, if you humble yourself, then God will exalt you. While that is true, and there's plenty of biblical evidence to support that, that is not the message here. The message here is that if you humble yourself in community with believers and with Christ, then all the glory goes to God. He continues to be exalted by your humility. Now maybe I'm jumping a little ahead. If you follow through these two steps, if you see this, uh, we understand what did Paul mean to the church in Philippi? He was urging them to be humble like Christ so that all glory could be to him. Then if we see what was God saying, God was saying that his son Christ is high, lifted up, sitting at his right hand, but ultimately that his example of humility is something we ought to strive for. So then we're left with the last two steps. What are the things that Christ is saying, or God is saying, forever? And what are the things that God is saying to you? The reality is that there's a number of interpretations. But I think at the end of the day, it's clear. We have a call to be humble beyond any reasonability. That we should make ourselves 
much, much less than those around us, and ultimately less than God, that he might receive glory from that. So then ultimately this application becomes, what does this mean for you? What does this mean for us as a church? The question's open-ended. And this is the beauty of Scripture. There is one message that can say a million things to you and I. So, before we close up, I do want to go over two more things. Uh, first is next week. Next week we're going to be diving into uh, chapter 2, verses 12 to 18. This is going to be a continuation of this uh, idea of exaltation. It continues to move on. Uh, I would encourage you to continue to use these four steps. What did Paul mean to the church in Philippi? What did God mean to the church in Philippi? What did God mean forever? And then what does God mean to us? Continue to follow those steps with that passage. Ideally, you're work, working through it every single week and kind of learning these tools along the way. Uh, the last thing is memory verse. If you are participating, this week's memory verse is going to be Philippians 2.4. It says, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. All right, well, River Church, I appreciate your time. Sorry I went a little long, but hopefully this was worthwhile. If you have any questions, feel free to call or text me. My number is 774 200 5279. Have a great week.